Okay, I think we're ready to begin. Good morning, everyone. It's really good to see everyone showed up on this uh, cold and snowy Friday to entertain and um, hear from uh, Brian McGowan. We're very excited that he was able to join us, um, especially you know, given the circumstances that we found ourselves in. Um, I was told, and I was teasing him, when I told Lori that we would need to cancel, she said, well, wait a minute, you know, we might have, I might have a friend who has research sitting around. And I thought that was kind of funny. So, <laughs> so she reached out to Brian and sure enough, he stepped up um, willingly. Um, so uh, we thank you. Thank you very much for doing this for us. And I also want to say, welcome back, Brian. I didn't know you were an alum. You were here in my gap years. I was out in the field teaching when you were here. Um, so it's wonderful to have another alum back. Um, so your faithfulness and loyalty to us is, is very much appreciated. In the spirit of Black excellence, we welcome and welcome home a special guest, Dr. Brian McGowan, who's a 2007 alum of our own HESA program. Dr. Brian McGowan is an associate professor and the associate director of pedagogy and higher education research in the Center for Teaching, Research and Learning at American University. Thank you very much. He is a critical constructivist. Brian's research is driven by questions that unearth the experiences of black college men and faculty in post-secondary education context. He is best known for his, excuse me, his contributions to the college student development literature regarding the social construction of gender and race in college men's interpersonal relationships. He's the co-editor of two books, Men and Masculinities, Theoretical Foundations and Promising Practices for Supporting College Men's Development and the Black Men in the Academy. Narratives of Resilience, Achievement, and Success. Dr. McGowan is the author of over 25 scholarly publications that appear in high-impact peer-reviewed journals, including the Journal of College Student Development, Equity, and Excellence in Education, Urban Education, the Journal of Diversity in Higher Education, and the Journal of Men's Studies, among others. Dr. McGowan is a frequently sought after expert on a wide range of education topics centered around inclusive college teaching and pedagogy and minoritizing college student experiences. He's come today to share his research in a talk he entitled Black Men in Higher Education, Past, Present, and Future. We're very excited to hear from you, Dr. Bri uh, Dr. Brian McGowan. Um, I bring to you now. Thank you. Good morning, good morning, everyone. Um, first and foremost, um, thank you, Karen. Thank you, Lori, for granting me this opportunity to be in community with you all today. Um, as y'all stated, I am a SPA, uh, master's alum of 2007. Um, it's good to be back. I really wish I could be there in person, <laughs> uh, but as you know, COVID-19 um, had its own agenda and disrupted the work that we do, but the work still needs to get done. Um, I, I recently won the New Leader Award and I was supposed to come back in April. I literally booked a flight <laughs> and had to cancel it the next day. And so again, I, I would love to be in community at Columbus soon. Um, really quickly before I jump into some content, um, it's just good to be home. Um, I tell people all the time, one of the best decisions I've ever made in my life as a first generation college student was leaving Virginia, um, leaving everything I knew to take a leap of faith and move to Columbus, Ohio. Um, I've had so many formative experiences at Ohio State that has shaped my career. Um, it's nice to be in community with people. Uh, some of you may familiar, um, may remember me when I was a master's student. Um, I think about um, Dr. Sue Speetson, uh, you know, I was her first advisee when she first got to Ohio State, you know, just thinking about um, many people who shaped my career. So I could name many, it's just good to see many familiar faces. Um, Black Excellence Week at OSU. So I'm also excited that I'm able to end the Black Excellence Week with this keynote um, during Black History Month as well. Um, I titled this talk, Black Men in Higher Education, Past, Present, and Future, as a way to discuss my work and some of the contributions that I've made to the higher education literature as it relates to Black men in higher ed, my current thinking around the work, some of the projects I'm currently engaged in and some of the questions that I'm looking at and some future considerations and where I think we need to be thinking about the work moving forward. And with that being said, I like to start each of my talks off with a little bit about me, um, how I'm positioned in the work. I think thinking about positionality, how we come to know what we know and our frame is very important. 
Um, I'm originally from Newport News, Virginia, so I'm not sure if anyone is familiar with the Tidewater area um, in Hampton Roads. I grew up around um, Hampton, Norfolk, Virginia Beach. That area is very near and dear to my heart. Um, if you are familiar with Newport News, my city sometimes gets a bad rep and they call it bad news as if that's all it is. And I'll tell you, for me, um, I choose to focus on the, the assets, the community cultural wealth that's embedded in my community. Uh, I'm a first generation college student. My mother was a single parent. She raised three kids making less than $10,000 a year, right? And, um, and, and I, I talk about those pieces. That's very important to me. Some of you on this call know I have a deep love and appreciation for seafood. Um, and I love seafood. I eat all types of seafood. But my love for seafood came from a place that a lot of people don't know. It wasn't just that I love seafood. For me, it was also a mode of survival. Um, again, as I said, my mother was a single parent raising three kids um, on a limited income. And it was five of us and four bicycles. And I live right by the water. And I remember I was the shortest, so I'm 5'5". Five five, so folks who know me, I, I, I'm short, you know, mighty at heart, but vertically challenged. But with that being said, because I was the smallest, I had to sit on the handlebars of someone. I never had my own bike, right? And so for 10 minutes, 15 minutes of discomfort, going down to the water, and we would fish and crab. And literally, my mother would say, I don't have any food to feed you all. So honestly, we're going to be out here all day, and we're going to catch our dinner. And we did that so often as a kid. Um, it was bonding for us. But I, I shared this story because I think it's important that we all have stories. And even though um, there were challenges embedded in my community, I choose to look at the things that are more positive. I think about mentors and positive role models that played a role in my development, um, in my church, in my schooling. I think about formative educational experiences and some that I will share shortly. Uh, and one of the most formative educational experiences that I've had is a pre-college program um, I was a kid who, you know, made good grades, but I had some behavioral challenges. And um, there was a new program that was being piloted in the city in the early 90s, and it changed my life. And it's called Achievable Dream Incorporated. Um, this program took kids out of the inner city, exposed them to college readiness. And I remember in fourth grade, all the way up, every single morning, I had to recite these banners. And I don't have them in front of me, I promise. I remember them. Um, and the banners I had to recite as a kid was proud to be drug free. Be cool, stay in school. Nothing was ever achieved without enthusiasm. It's nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice. Decisions are up to me. I can go to college if I work hard. And Achievable Dream loves me. I am someone special. I will say no to guns. I will say no to drugs. I had to say that every single morning. I wrote them down. They were on my walls. Because again, those weren't just banners that I had to recite as a requirement for the program. They also became a guide that... Um, that shaped my life choices, right? I believed in that program. And again, that was another formative experience. And so when I think about um, my career and where I'm at today, I think it's really important to own how you come into the space and the experiences that you bring. Because they not only shape who I am as a practitioner, but also who I am as a scholar and how I go about my work. In terms of OSU, I want to talk about some of those formative experiences before I really get into my work. Um, again, the place is very near and dear to my heart. Um, the, the Bell Resource Center on African American Male. I was a first quarter graduate student when that when that center started, right? And I say quarter. I know you're all semesters now, but we were quarters when I was there, right? So, um, but I had an opportunity to conduct literature reviews and moderate panels and mentor undergraduate students. Um, in my first year as a master's student, that was very formative and helped shape my research agenda around Black men, some of which you'll hear about in a little bit. Um, when I first left Ohio State in 2007, my first job was at Rutgers University, and I had an opportunity to work with the Black Men's Collective there. Again, being in spaces to mentor Black men, that helped me and even some of my own insights. While I was there, I had a formative opportunity to be on a research team that was led by Dr. Sean Harper, alongside um, five other practitioners across the country where we looked at Black men's experiences um, with race and racism in their role as resident assistants and thinking about the undue scrutiny that Black men face or having to serve as spokespersons for their races or being stereotyped because of their supervisor's perceptions of Black men that are oftentimes rooted in deficit ideology, right? And so those formative experiences helped me and it prompted me to want to get a PhD where I ended up going to Indiana University. Um, 
And a formative course I took in student development theory helped me um, realize that within the literature, the stories of Black men, there are other stories that are not told. And I think it's so important that we author our own narratives. And I saw an opportunity to start thinking about the, some of the interpersonal realities that Black men face on college campuses that are not illuminated in the literature, but more importantly, that I think are often misunderstood by people who design policy and practice to improve the experiences of Black men. And so I say all of that to say that we as educators, um, we need to think about the experiences that we create. I'm drawing on these formative experiences from my childhood and throughout different spaces that I've been on my educational journey as life altering, right? And so my, my challenge and question is, what life altering and formative experiences are you creating for students in your work? My story is not an outlier, but too often these stories are not told and reflected in the literature. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about, again, I titled the talk Past, Present, and Future. So I want to talk a little bit about my current work, excuse me, my past work. Um, some of you may be familiar with, but I'll just do this in a very summative way and more breadth. But my past work cuts across four domains. The first one being around post-secondary enrollment and completion. And so thinking about how many Black men are in college. And you know, for every three Black men that enters the predominantly white campus space, only one graduates. So if you think about that, what does that mean in terms of retention? Like what is happening in the experiences for Black men, right? How are they experiencing campus environments? And so in my work, and I can tease this out a bit later, two things that I found in my work as it relates to post-secondary enrollment and completion is that climates matter. Right, what climates are Black men experiencing, but also the interpersonal realities and connections to peers, which is a huge piece that I think we take for granted about how Black men are making sense and conceptualizing and making meaning of their experiences in college, which leads me to the second domain. Um, I do a lot of work thinking about peer relationships. As we know, and as you all know in your own lives, being connected to peers in meaningful ways matters. Right? And so thinking about peer influence as a dominant change agent in the college experience. But how are these connections created? And so just one piece that I draw on in my work, I think about the creation of these connections and the maintenance of them, right? So if you're thinking about the creation, when Black men enter campus spaces, how are they forming peer connections? And one of the key vehicles is through pre-college programs. So you think about summer bridge programs, you know, where individuals come to campus, for a few weeks before the semester starts. You know, I start, I think a lot about um, funding cuts and so often these programs are targeted for budget cuts. But yet I find in my research that they are formative spaces where black men form community that they maintain throughout their college years. They, in my studies, they draw on those initial experiences. I form friendships in these spaces. They became my roommates. These became my accountability partners. These are people I play with and play basketball with or people I study with in the library, right? Like I'm illuminating these realities and I often think, and I challenge people, you know, as you're making budgetary decisions, think about some of the interpersonal experiences that happen in these programs that are formative that allow people to stay in school, right? And so for me, that's one, one takeaway in the work. I also think about what role does race play in the process of forming connections? So some of my earlier work illuminates on a continuum, how black men even come to form peer connections based on race. So on a continuum being thinking about folks who have less salient racial identities or individuals who kind of have a colorblind ideology approach to how they approach their um, peer connections. They may have friendships with people who don't look like them and then have formative experiences in college where they may have some challenges maintaining those connections across race right? Or on a continuum, thinking about those who have more pro-Black attitudes or collectivist orientation about how they view Blackness, that shows up in the ways that they form and connect with peers, right? And so I illustrate that on a continuum and everything in between. I think about some of the gendered realities that moves me to my third point in thinking about the role of gender, right? And what are some of the gendered patterns that we see? Um, there's been calls over the past decade or so for scholars to think about some of the gender behaviors um, facing Black men. And so I took this charge up, drawing on some of the work of Judith Butler, um, thinking about gender as performance, right? So gender being a performance, so even that conception. 
but also thinking about some of Keith Alexander's work um, who talks about um, the art of passing and passing being a cultural performance. So I'm thinking about how are black men passing on campus and this is where I think about the intersections of the merging of like gender and gender identities and sexual orientation and think about how those those pieces play out in the college environment as well. Um, one example I'll just bring out in the work about people not feeling that they can be their authentic selves in the college environment. They'd have to compartmentalize important aspects of their identity to fit into certain circles, right? So how can, so thinking through that, like how can we foster um, authenticity among black men but also understanding that Black men and their bodies are under constant scrutiny and attack, right? And so how can I promote authenticity within these toxic types of environments? So those are questions that I think about and grapple with. And the other piece, just thinking about the literature in terms of like gender patterns and behavior, um, a lot of the literature around college men and masculinities would frame a competition as being something that's a barrier, right? But my work finds that competition was actually healthy. So, and I'll talk about method, methodologically how I do my work, but I do um, use visual methods in my work and I have my participants submit, submit photographs of what they are experiencing. And so there were photographs of like video game scores or test scores because it wasn't, it was competition in a way that was healthy and peer accountability. So even the ways that we can reframe some of the literature base that's, um, very Eurocentric in nature, and many of those earlier studies were conducted on white men, and I wanted to problematize that literature base. And then the last um, area of my past work looks at just thinking about race and racism, right? Um, I talked about some of the racial realities um, in terms of the um, how they form connection and maintain them on campus, but in terms of racism and the racism that Black men experiences in these predominantly white climates, having to develop coping strategies and those coping mechanisms were each other. They lean and rely on one another to um, navigate the predominantly white campus in many ways that was toxic for them. Um, and also thinking about peer accountability, they knew they needed each other. And I wanna be very clear when I talk about racism, I'm talking about it across three levels, right? We can talk about racism at an individual level it's easy to recognize and understand like verbal abuse or maybe offensive jokes or comments that perpetuate negative stereotypes. Like we can see that and they did experience that. But also I wanna talk about cultural racism as well, right? This whole notion that um, the idea of conforming to a single culture is normal and desirable and that it rationalizes or and perpetuates racial inequality through an ideology of cultural superiority and inferiority. I pretty much tell folks, because you don't understand my culture doesn't mean it's wrong. You don't understand it. So that's not my issue, that's your issue, right? And so when you think about cultural racism, um, so I'm putting the onus back. That has nothing to do with me. So work through your stuff and stop projecting it onto me, right? And then the final ways that I think about racism is institutionally, right? Thinking about our laws, thinking about the rules and practices that have the effect of providing benefits to one group that are not given to others. So what policies and practices are we embracing, right? We internalize a lot of things. We enforce a lot of policies that sometimes we don't even agree with, but we still enforce them because we think it's the right thing to do. Are you questioning and looking at these policies and practices critically? So what role are you playing? And I pose those questions and I, I shape racism in these ways because these are the ways that participants were able to identify racism in their college experiences. A little bit more in terms of some of my past work and before I start talking about present and future, um, thinking about some contributions to um, thinking about methods and using visual methods to explore the experiences of college students. And so again, I talked about um, the use of photographs. So I try to, in my, my work in terms of design, at least have multiple touch points with participants. So I'll do an initial interview to build rapport with them, but then I have them submit photographs to illustrate various phenomena. So submit photographs that illustrate your friendships with other men. And I'm able to see spaces and places where they feel affirmed, spaces and places where they do not. Individuals who were key in their college experiences, right? Whether it's family, whether it's other peers, whether it's the classroom, whether it's certain professors, like I'm able to glean insights and they're authoring their own narratives, right? So I use photo elicitation in my work. 
So for me, eliciting, I'm interested in how they use these photographs to tell their stories. So I'm less interested in the photograph itself, but more so it's a vehicle for them to tell their stories and then to author their own narratives. I am really big on people authoring their own stories because so often they're told for us, right? Um, I think about the influences of hometown communities, powerful influences. We need to understand where folks come from, right? I, I, I consider myself a critical constructivist. I'm deeply interested in how people come to know what they know, but also interrogating the systems in which they occupy, right? And so for me, when I think about hometowns, I often think about um, practice and our program offerings. How are we programming in ways that facilitate success for Black men? I think part of that is understanding students. Like how often, let me get on my soapbox real quick. How often do we design programs and we think we know what people need and we never ask them what they need, right? And so people say, so how can I do that? I'm like, well, have you ever asked a Black man what they need? Well, no, well, the literature says, have you asked a Black man what they need? Okay, so that's the solution. Let's start there, right? And so I think about, and sometimes you'll see that what are things are important to them? A lot of that comes from their hometown communities. So thinking about that, um, thinking about some of those pre-college socializing agents that shape the ways that they think about gender. Um, in my work, I found that parents played a huge role, particularly fathers and even participants um, drawn on the fact that some who didn't have fathers, how they felt like they had missed out on some key aspects of understanding what it meant to be a man and how to perform on their gender, which came out in my work. Thinking about mentoring programs, pre-college mentoring programs came up. Thinking about the role of sports and other um, men peers in school. Those were socializing agents that helped them come to know what they know. And it makes the case for me, we need to reframe gender in higher education. We need to think about it in more nuanced ways, right? Um, and so how are we rearing boys and men? And we have to think about um, rearing men who are anti-homophobic in nature, right? Black boys and men who are anti-sexist, like how are we doing that? How are we embedding that? So by the time they get to college that they can debunk some of these toxic no notions of what it means to, um, to perform gender. We also need to think about lessons from intersectionality. So some of my work thinks about intersectionality and I'm also thinking about some of um, Dr. Patton Davis's work as well, who's been a leader for us in this area in higher education. But gender and other social identities are extricably linked, right? Like you can't just talk about these pieces and not thinking about them intersectionally. Um, so again, gender and other social identities um, are shaped by social structural inequities and gender is socially constructed and it's an interactive process. And so just even making the case that as we think about gender, we need to think about those things, intersectionality and also grapple with broader questions of power. Um, I also, again, thinking about context for vulnerability, my past work illuminates this and thinking about, um, I have a piece in the Journal of Men's Studies where um, I wrote a piece about the interview process itself. So I interviewed men, built rapport with them, had them submit photographs and talk about them. And then I asked them, how did you experience this process? And overwhelmingly, they were grateful to be in my study because no one's ever asked them questions. Like they were able to tap into sides of them that they didn't even know. Um, some of them needed therapy or counseling and didn't even realize it, right? And so there were powerful moments. I had 147 photographs in this study that I'm drawing on and I'm currently replicating this study and I'll talk about some of my current work and what I'm finding at, as we speak. But the point I wanna make here is that how are we in our campus spaces creating context for vulnerability? How can black men be their authentic selves in college and they don't have to perform or pass in spaces to fit in, right? And they saw my study as a vehicle to be themselves. So I would love to be able to like replicate that feeling in other capacities, in other spaces in the campus environment. And then last thing in terms of thinking about uh, my past work, I try to make explicit connections for practitioners. So often as scholars, we're, we're worried about the, you know, the rigorous study and the robust findings, but translating them to people who actually need it on the grounds. And so for me, in addition to some of my consulting work, I try my best to have rich implications that people can actually do something about the, my findings, right? And so my first book was titled Black Men in the Academy. And I drew on narratives, again, wanting to tell a different story. I um, invited um, student affairs administrators, faculty, and students to write stories. 
stories of resilience. How did you come to be where you are today? And again, I think we must author a new narrative that's based on our own words and not ones that are dictated by others. And so I wanted to have an entire volume that, that did that. Um, so for me, lessons learned, these stories of resilience aren't new. They're not new <laughs> stories, but so often we don't amplify those voices and those narratives. And that's something that I look to do in my work is to uplift um, the stories of black men. So that's a quick summary of my past work. Um, for those who weren't familiar with it, to try to couch it across those domains. I want to talk about what I'm presently doing. And this is the fun stuff, right? You know, um, and some of you on this call may know, you know, when I have a split appointment here at American University. So in addition to being a professor, I'm also the associate director of our teaching, research and learning center. Um, and in that work, I work with each of the academic colleges around inclusive teaching, inclusive pedagogy. So I run task force with representatives. I have programming series to think about the work. And so I'm grateful to be in this teaching and learning space because it's really helping me think about my work with black men in different ways. So in, in terms of our current context, right? Thinking about the, the past four years um, that we've been under, but let's be very clear, racism was taking place before the past four years. I think sometimes we get so stuck in, oh, in the past four years, and yes, it was amplified in different ways, but you know, when you, when you think critically about these pieces, it's nothing new, right? Um, critical race theory teaches that, that racism is endemic, it's permanent. So it's not, does racism exist? It's how do we navigate racism? How do we deal with it, right? It's not questioning its existence. But the racism that has happened in our society um, has played a role in how students are maintaining, um, you know, thinking about mental health, just thinking about even just navigating and existing, right? Like this has been really difficult for a lot of people. Um, you know, I live in DC, so I'm just thinking about January 6th and the insurrection, you know, like, so for me, like it, it's been really difficult for people to even navigate and focus. So I wanna just talk, talk about our current context a bit. And COVID-19, as we know, has disrupted our lives. It also has um, unearthed some inequities that were already existing, but they're even more exacerbated in this period been thinking a lot in this current climate, thinking about retention and belonging. Like how are we retaining students in this climate and how are we making them feel like they belong in these virtual environments? I've been thinking deeply about mental health. The uh, current piece I'm working on is really thinking about black men and mental health pre and post COVID, even though we're not in post COVID. So hopefully that does exist soon. Uh, <laughs> but we're gonna be talking about COVID-19 for quite some time because its impacts are, are, are throughout um, I've been thinking about policies and practices, right? So all these committees, let's redo our policies, let's redo our practices. And, you know, I've been thinking about that. I've been thinking deeply about teaching and pedagogy. And I'll talk about some of those pieces because I think that's very helpful in the work that we do as educators. And the last thing I've been thinking about in this current context is our new administration. You know, what, what, what are we gonna do to advance social justice and, and racial justice in particular, right? So these are the things I'm thinking about right now and it's important to talk about those things because it's informing my current work with Black men, right? And so I received a grant to do a pilot study that I just finished collecting data for. Um, I did 26 interviews via Zoom this fall with Black men. And I literally uh, just went through all of my audio recordings this week and I plan to begin data analysis next week. So what's interesting is I'm in right in the middle of making sense of this, but um, I'm really gleaning some insights about how black men are experiencing racism and how they're experiencing COVID-19 and this impact that it's had on their college experience. Um, I think what will be helpful for this discussion um, is to think about teaching and pedagogy, right? And we're, you know, we're all committed to student success. We should be, right? And improving the student experiences. We want students to have optimal experiences in college. But one thing that I'm finding in my current work is that students, uh, white students in particular, are being bolder in classroom spaces because they're hiding behind screens saying racist comments in classrooms, right? So this is what I'm, I'm picking up on in my new work. Um, I asked participants, you know, if they could give advice to their favorite professor, what would you say to them? And if you can give feedback to your least favorite professors, what would you say to them? And so I, I gleaned insights around teaching and pedagogy from black men and consistently that professors need to check their bias and their anti-Black rhetoric. And again, that's just not 
And again, I don't want to make this binary because not only white people can perpetuate anti-black ways, right? And so, you know, that phrase is kinfolk and your kinfolk, you know, and so for, again, these are words from my participants about the perpetuation of anti-blackness and how that shows up and the constant lifting up of whiteness that we need to interrogate, right? And so these are from the mouths of my participants. So I can say this as well, literature supports that, but this is what they're experiencing in real time in COVID. So to that point, you know, I'm just making the case that we need to be culturally responsive in our teaching approaches, right? And in our pedagogy. So I draw on a lot of work from um, Gloria Lassen Billings and Geneva Gay in particular, um, and how can we create culturally responsive, um, culturally relevant spaces in our teaching? And I love drawing on the work of Geneva Gay. She talks about um, these four pillars of practice, right? Um, that if you embrace these four things, you are being a culturally responsive teacher and it should lead to various outcomes. So thinking about culturally responsive caring, like students want us to know that we care about them. Right, that came up in my work. You know, black men want to know like that we care about them. So, what are your attitudes and expectations for students? Right, being culturally responsive also means thinking about cultural communication. You know, I know in student affairs we talk a lot about meeting students where they are. Right, how are you meeting students where they are if you don't understand them and culturally? Right, and so thinking about those pieces, how are we thinking about culture in our curriculum? the ways that it shows up in the formal curriculum, but the ways that we engage students outside of the formal curriculum. Or thinking about diverse content that we bring into our courses. So again, this talk is around black men. Do black men see themselves in the curriculum that you have? Oh, well, my discipline, we don't know. You can. Have you done the work to see, are there black authors? Or can you draw on examples that lift up black people? People want to see themselves reflected in the curriculum. And also thinking about culturally congruent instructional strategies. So how are you even pedagogically um, engaging students? And that becomes more of a challenge in the virtual environment, but not impossible, right? And so again, we can't continue to, to do the things that we are doing that can oppress people's experiences. And so to Geneva Gay's work, if we're thinking about these pillars of practice, it should lead to outcomes that are validating for students. Students should feel validated in your classroom, right? So how are we validating, making Black men feel validated? And, and some of that comes from those pillars of practice I talked about around caring and seeing themselves reflected. We should think about this in multi-dimensional multi ways. There's no one way to do this, right? Um, how are we creating experiences that are empowering, right? How are we uplifting them? They should be transformative. They should be emancipatory, right? And so the point I'm trying to get at is, is that if we're employing culturally responsive teaching approaches, fewer Black men will feel left out in the classroom. But that places the onus on us as educators, right? And not placing the onus on students. We so often place the onus on students and we need to look inward as educators. And so again, um, I'm grateful to be in this teaching and learning space and the student affairs space, right? And so it's giving me a, a more holistic view of the college experiences sitting in these two roles. Currently, I'm also thinking a lot about mental health, right? Um, and it has been exacerbated. Um, my participants are talking about college counseling centers and how they don't see counselors that look like them, right? Or counselors that don't understand their experiences or make judgments around things they don't understand. So it gets me back to the point I was making around cultural racism earlier. Because you don't understand doesn't mean it's incorrect. You just don't understand it. So how are we even staffing our counseling centers um, or some black men had mentioned I started therapy and I stopped because I didn't feel comfortable or I'm leaving the campus environment to seek therapy off campus because I don't feel comfortable, right? I'm excited that I'm noticing in my work that more black men are willing to acknowledge the need for therapy, right? You know, that, that, that's amazing, right? And so I think in this period, there's something here that I'm hoping to continue to tease out. And again, when I think about the future, of the work, I'm thinking about where do we go next in this work? So again, my work is situated around that retention, engagement, interpersonal relationship space. And I'm currently doing work that's thinking about racism and what does it mean to be a black man, a black man who's a college student in a time of COVID, in a time of increasing racism that's very um, overt, right? But in the future, where do we need to go? And 
thinking about which stories aren't told, which populations aren't lifted up. So what are some emerging populations of Black men um, that we need to highlight? Um, thinking about frameworks, which frameworks do we need to employ to, to tell these stories, right? And so what are some of those newer frameworks or which other disciplines should we draw on in an interdisciplinary manner to shape the work that we do? Um, those are things that I'm currently thinking about in terms of future work. I'm all about uplifting stories of those who are minoritized, underrepresented, and stories that are untold in the academy. Um, I'll stop there. <laughs> um, I'll stop there and invite a Q&A, invite a conversation. But essentially, thank you for having me talk about my research, what I've done, what I'm currently doing, and just some things that we should think about as we the goal is to uplift the experiences of Black men and to improve their um, experiences in college. And so thank you. Thank you. That was awesome. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, if you have questions for Brian, you can either raise your hand or put them in the chat. Um, there's only, let's see, there's, well, there's, there's quite a few. So I was going to say <laughs> you can just chime in, but um, if you need to just chime in, that's fine. If you don't want to type it in, that's fine too. Brian, thank you so very much. I really appreciated um, the mantra that you recited um, as a child that carried you through. Um, it was powerful um, in ways that I think, you know, it would be good to have to share with other students at some point, you know, just to have it. Um, I especially like, you know, in academe, things get so crazy busy and people get kind of edgy. So I really liked the, um, it's nice to be important, but more important to be nice. Yes. So that, that's powerful. Thank you. I also appreciated the conversations around um, how Black men are, are finding ways to express themselves, especially now. The mental, mental issue, the mental illness issues are real and, and they don't have to be so severe to be diagnosed, but they are absolutely real and impactful for all of us, not just Black men, but especially when you're in these um, spaces of intersectionality. Um, does anyone have a question or a comment for Brian? If not, that's fine too. <laughs> I'm joking. No, that's fine. Okay, um, well, I'd like you to expound oh. on one thing. Oh, okay, well, wait, okay. So Scott says, Dr. McGowan, you mentioned representation in college spaces and the College of Education and Humanity College. There are currently no black male faculty in leadership development pipeline. We have three departments which have chairs, associate chairs and assistant chairs, four associate deans, diversity, research, faculty affairs and academic affairs. And in educational studies, we have 11 program chairs and none are black men. What recommendation would you have for individuals, particularly black male graduate students who don't see themselves in this environment, which kind of takes us back to, you know, if you don't see yourself, you don't see yourself doing that. Yeah, Scott, I appreciate the question. Um, this is a common problem across many of our institutions um, in this way. I'll answer your question, but I'm actually, you know, you say you shouldn't answer a question with a question, but I'm actually gonna throw this back and rephrase it because I think even this question, and I will think about advice for Black graduate students, but I'm, it, your question makes me think about for those of us who are hiring, right? So I want to throw the, put the onus on us. You know, part of the reason we don't see them represented in space is because we're not giving them opportunities to be in the space, right? And so we can talk about aspirations, goal setting. I want to, you know, graduate students, how do, how do we even enter these spaces? We can think about um, mentoring and pipeline work. So I can take that approach. You know, if you don't see yourselves there, um, a possibility model. For me, I, I think about possibility models all the time. Um, but this whole notion of onlyness and how Black men, and I'll make this even more inclusive, Black people are only in campus spaces. That's a real thing. But I want to go back to who is making the decisions around hiring. And it makes me think about hiring policies, but also some of the biases that play a role. And so for me, that would be my response to that. We need to change that. We need to see more. Um, again, I know this focus, this talk is around Black men in particular, but I would just argue that more Black people in leadership. And that means that we need to hire Black people. Let's just, we need to bet on Black people. And so th that's what I'm going to say to that question. But I do appreciate it. 
Thank you. Anyone else? I have one question and Brian, I'm not sure, you may have uh, mentioned this when I stepped away, but in your uh, work in looking at black men, how, how or have you uh, up to this point had opportunities to um, explore the experiences of black trans uh, students um, uh, and their, yeah, that's the main question. Yeah, you know, and, and I haven't actually, and you know, so I, I'm even thinking about future and where the work should go. Um, that's an area I do want to tap into, um, particularly as I push thinking about um, challenging the field in the ways that we should think about gender, right? I think part of that is conducting studies on, on Black trans students' experiences on trans men, right? And so for me, that is something that, so my work doesn't do that to date, um, but it's something that I have been thinking about. Um, so I guess more to come. Thank you for the question. Yeah. I'd like you to, and maybe if you have, if you can, um, mm -hmm. expound a little bit more on the notion that you describe as cultural racism within an organization. <laughs> I think that sometimes um, race is seen as, you know, or racism is seen as this overt act when actually the microaggressions that we are aware of really come in a very subversive way in these organizational climates. So can you talk a little bit more about um, cultural racism as you describe it? Yeah, I just think, you know, um, I appreciate that question and cultural racism, as I mentioned earlier, does show up. In terms of how, I think about just, so let me make this personal and then I'll talk more broader, like things that are important to me culturally that, I may have learned that I may do, and people may form stereotypes or judgments around those pieces based on who I am. Like these are things that are important to my culture. So whether it's a, the types of activities I may engage in or, um, or ways that I may speak, right? And we think about language and vernacular or thinking about, um, thinking about, I think about policy a lot too when around culture. Um, one example I like to give um, for those who are rooted in the student affairs space, I think about campus activities. I think about Greek life when um, pre-COVID, when we were actually doing Greek, <laughs> Greek life events in person, that when the um, historically black fraternities and sororities would throw events, you would see police presence and metal detectors that folks would have to go through, right? But then when other organizations, right. uh, on their events, you don't see those pieces, right? And so for right. some reason, through, and again, that's not necessarily written down a policy, right? This is just, oh, black people are coming together to throw an event. We need to have police presence and metal detectors. Like, wait a minute. Right. Like, like, so for me, there's something about that that's culturally racist. You have some Absolutely. ideas around my culture. It's kind of cultural and institutional, but the problem is that I found with this particular example is that there's no written policy that that needs to happen, right? That's just people who are in power's response to seeing black people wanting to organize and be in community. Right, so there's some cultural racism going on there that sometimes goes unchecked. Oh, I never even realized I did that. Yeah, right. And so, um, and those party um, registration part policies in student affairs, it some of that stuff comes out. So that will be one example of a of a practice that's interrogated. Yeah, I have another question, but thank you for that. That reminds me, I was president of Theta chapter here of the sorority and Drake Union um, back in the day was really guilty of doing this to us a lot. They would make us have police protection and just drama, a lot of drama. I stopped going to Drake behind that. So Jackie asked this question. This has been terrific presentation, thank you. I'm a historian, sexuality and gender. I'm a historian of sexuality and gender in education, which requires navigation between mm -hmm. dealing with how others see queer folks and how we see ourselves. How do you think about navigating this tension between how others define black males and how black men you study define themselves? Tension between how others define and how the men, whew. So Jackie, <laughs> this is a loaded question, loaded question. Um, the tension between, all right, so my attempt at answering this, Jackie. So I think for me, the tension, I think lies in, I think some of the pieces that I had mentioned earlier, thinking about some of the um, deficit orientation that comes into 
thinking about their experiences. And so many of, so let me backtrack. In my former work um, of the 17 participants in this particular study I was drawing on, six of them identified as either being gay or bisexual. And in my current work, I'm noticing about maybe 35 to 40% of my participants are identifying as that as well. And so in terms of the, the population of students who are openly identified in that way, so I have a sizable number of students in my study who identify as gay or bisexual. But for many of them, it was across a continuum, right? It was the messaging that I had talked about, about what does it mean to be a man and trying to transcend some of the traditional or stereotypical expectations of how men should behave. They're actively pushing against that. But others also, they see it as a point of pride, right? Like I'm proud of my queer identities, right? And so I don't think we always uplift that. Like I think sometimes, um, educators working with queer students see that as something that's negative and it's like no like this is important this is an integral part of who I am and so I just think the whole tension sometimes comes when they're interacting with other people on campus and feeling ostracized because of their queer identities right so I think that you see that piece at play but I also think sometimes um, within peer-to-peer -peer. so Jackie one question that I do ask in my work um, and again, trying to get people to talk about these pieces, um, I ask, tell me about how you form and maintain peer connections to individuals with a differing sexual orientation than your own. So if you think about the way I phrased that question, how they answer that, I can draw some inferences based on how they answer that question. And when I, a when I ask that question, um, some folks are more guarded and they stumble with the question. But then when they get more comfortable with me as a researcher, they get more comfortable talking about their gender and sexual identities. And so, but to that question, um, many of my participants have talked about um, not only the sense of pride, some of the barriers that they face in interacting. So for those who identify as being heterosexual, talks about um, on a continuum, either like those pieces doesn't matter, or it actually does matter and I choose my friends in different ways. And so I illustrate that work. Um, so again, being a critical constructivist, I'm interested in how people make meaning. Um, so that that kind of goes with your question. And so I illuminate the ways that people make meaning in their approaches in that work. So hopefully that, that, that answered that. I love that question around the tension, Jackie. Love that. Anyone else? Brian, have you thought about how this work um, transcend, transcends across different campus contexts? So we recently published something that looking at HBCUs. Um, we know about the Morehouse Appropriate Attire Policy. Um, you, you made the earlier comment about uh, kinfolk ain't skinfolk, but I think it looks different when we're talking about sexualities. Um, uh, in, in uh, HBCU spaces and how those sort of play out. And there's been, I guess, I, I would say definitely more growth in that area uh, around um, uh, HBCUs becoming more welcoming spaces for uh, these identities. But uh, do you see that as part of your work or some emphasis on uh, men who are attending HBCUs? Yeah, so thank you for going there. And yes, so I had acknowledged um, earlier in the presentation in terms of my current work, how I received a pilot grant. And so some of the insights that I had mentioned when I was talking about my present work came out of this pilot study that um, I am still in, at the very beginning of data um, analysis around the work. When I wrote the grant, the goal was to get some insights, um, again, a pilot study to go after a larger grant. I want to replicate this study across institution types. And so I wonder what does this look like at HBCU, thinking about HSIs, broadly thinking about community colleges. So I would love to actually take this and actually go across different institutional contexts because I'm confident that um, what I've noticed in this work, um, both of these studies have been done at predominantly white, historically white institutions um, that are geographically in different places, right? Um, one being in the Midwest and then one being in the Mid-Atlantic. I'm at a private institution. So I have a public and private insights, but I would like to go into the HBCU culture to illuminate some of those pieces as well. So stay tuned. So let's let us hope one of these grant agencies give me some funds so I can actually go about doing that work very soon. <laughs> Great. 
Okay, well, I don't see any more questions in the chat. I'll open up and do a polite pause for a few more minutes if anyone has anything they would like to ask of Brian or say to Brian. Okay, seeing none, I assume, oh. Oh, great talk. Okay. Seeing um, none, then I assume all hearts are at peace. Thank you again, Brian, so very much for bringing this to us. And like I said, the quick turnaround, um, Lori, I don't know if you were on when I made mention of the fact that when I told you we were going to make some changes, you said, oh, let me call Brian. He's got research sitting around. And I was like, <laughs> Oh, who does that? <laughs> so that tells us just how prolific you are. And I look forward to reading more um, and learning more from you, Brian. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Love everyone. It. Good to be back home. Yeah, it's good to have you. And look forward to a time when we can walk the Oval again. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Take care, everyone. Have a great weekend. Bye.